All right, so we're going to start looking at Gorbachev and the Soviet Union from 85 to 91. And the first thing that we have to do is look at these two policies called Glasnost and Perestroika. Glasnost was primarily aimed at the government and Perestroika was largely aimed at the economy. And these two things are going to work together to A, destroy the Soviet Union and B, um, provide an overview for or an umbrella for all of the policies that Gorbachev is going to implement. Now, I break things down into political reform, economic, etc., but realize that some of those divisions are somewhat artificial. Especially when we're looking at the Soviet Union in this time, there is a real um, sort of mixing interrelationship between all of these various things. So as we talk about political reform now, Keep this stuff in mind when we start talking more specifically about the economic issues and mm, understand how each will influence the other. Under Gorbachev, the USSR imploded and it ended in 1991. And that's part of this journey. Taking what we know uh, that happened under Khrushchev, under Brezhnev, and then with what's happening under Gorbachev to explain why the Soviet Union collapses in 1991. And there are people who very negatively view Gorbachev um, as essentially being the grave digger of the Soviet Union. So historian Macaulay says if Lenin was the founder of the Soviet Union, then Gorbachev was the grave digger. But we know that it's a lot more complex than that. Gorbachev was a committed communist. So what he was doing wasn't purposefully to tear down the system. He believed in communism. He had been a member of the youth organization um, from the time that he uh, was at university. But he saw a lot of inefficiencies and problems in the system that needed addressing. So he didn't, he wasn't trying to um, seek radical change, but to inject new blood, new ways of thinking and reformation within the Communist Party. It just so happens that the system had just reached a point that uh, that, that reformation kind of uh, broke it. And he didn't want to move toward capitalism. He wanted to stimulate and increase economic growth. He completely recognized that the Soviet Union was in a state of stagnation and regression, actually. And there needed to be some improvements. So he still wanted state socialism, but figure out some ways that this could be coupled with economic growth. So in order to reinvigorate the party and reform the party, he started changing the composition of the Communist Party. He placed a lot of younger people in power. A lot of those people had been sort of down there with him, had been wanting to change um, the party and um, also change the policies, but didn't have an opportunity to because of the Brezhnevites, the Brezhnev Mafia in charge. He um, sought to get rid of people to reduce corruption. And by re reducing corruption, you get people in there who want to improve the party. The people who benefited from corruption want things to remain the same. And so by getting rid of them, you get people who uh, are looking at the global picture and the betterment of the party and the country rather than their own um, benefits. And so by 1988, so within three years, he had replaced half of the Politburo, half of the provincial party secretaries, and two thirds of the government ministers. However, despite all of this, he still had a lot of opposition from the lower level Communist Party officials. So he replaced a lot of the people at the top, but at the same time, remember, as we still spoken about previously, in a country like the Soviet Union, the party, the Communist Party, 
is the only place that you can really rise um, and better yourself and achieve any of those benefits. It's the only source of becoming an elite within the country. Working hard, getting a good education, that's not going to work in the communist, um, in the communist system. Uh, starting your own business, that's not going to work. Being an innovator, that's not going to work. The only avenue to getting into any sort of elite position is through the party. And so, of course, you have people in the party who um, are idealists, but you also have a lot of people who have entered the party for this very reason. And with the reforms that Gorbachev was making, people saw this as an ending of their opportunity for advancement. So there was quite a lot of opposition uh, to the reforms. By the end, and we'll see this when we start talking about the coup in, uh, in 91, by the end, Gorbachev is under attack from those on the right who want to keep things the same and those on the left who want reforms but they feel that the pace of Gorbachev's reforms aren't fast enough. So Gorbachev is essentially politically um, caught between a, a rock and a hard place. Uh, the people that he helped put into power who are all gung-ho for massive amounts of change and liberalization and then there are the people on the right who want the system to remain the same because they want that stability and what they can get out of the system through it. Gorbachev also begins some serious reform of the political system. Part of that is because he recognizes that um, perestroika, that is the restructuring of the economy, is going to have some growing pains and people are going to suffer some. And so the hope is that by allowing them participation in the political process, then um, maybe they'll feel like they've had, they have gained something. In the previous set, we looked at the overall changes that Gorbachev brought to the party. And this was really about the party leadership, who was holding power, and the idea is by removing some of those challenges, he would be able to uh, reform. So the political reforms are going to really begin after this time period. And what he's going to do here is fundamentally change how the Communist Party and uh, how the government functions in the country. What he wants to do is decrease the party control of the state apparatus. He recognized that the Soviet economy and the society um, were both in crisis. And the way to do that was to reform the role of the party uh, within the government. And he's going to provide some distance between the Communist Party and the state apparatus. He, he recognizes that the, for example, problems that Khrushchev had in bringing about reform was that there was too much double dipping, there was uh, too much overlap between the Communist Party and the functioning of the state. Therefore, the state couldn't function independently. So in order to do this, he's going to reform the role of the party, as stated. He's going to reform the electoral system, that is how people get elected and voted into their positions. He's going to change the legislative system, the way laws are created. He is going to change the executive body, that is the control that the people who implement the laws have. And he's also going to change the way the bureaucracy functions that is the actual nuts and bolts of the government. So, in essence, he's going to completely reform the Soviet system. How he didn't realize that this was going to um, be all kinds of bad for him and, and that this was going to really break the system, I don't know. But hindsight, 2020, you know what I'm saying? So in 1987, he announced because of this crisis, facing the Soviet Union, he is going to, uh, he, that the, the systems needed more democracy. 
and they would begin with competitive elections in June. And so the idea here is this was essentially going to be the first time in generations since people had a choice as to who they would be electing. And he establishes a new electoral law uh, for this in the December of the next year. From 1988, the pace of political reform increases. So from January of that year, uh, Gorbachev announces that the local and regional Soviets are all going to be multi-candidate elections. Remember that previously, the party put forth a candidate and you voted for that candidate. Now, uh, there will be more choice for people. At the 19th Communist Party Conference in June of 88, changes were approved for the methods of appointing party officials. Now, keep in mind is by the time we're having this conference, um, he has a lot of people uh, seated throughout the party who will support him. And what this calls for is fixed terms for people participating in the um, in the Congress and again multi-candidate elections to the Communist Party for participation in the higher party especially the higher um, party positions and this basically increased democracy within the party the idea is that people have a say as to whether or not you're doing a good job and um, you can't just enter the party and stay there for life and accrue benefits. So this is also going to feed into the shaking up of the system to allow for economic um, improvements. Robert Service says that the party was being dropped as the vanguard of per perestroika because we know that um, that as as Gorbachev believed that there was no way for perestroika and those economic reforms to be successful if you still have um, the same people in power accruing benefits, stymieing the development. As a result of continuing resistance in the party, in December, there was the creation of the Congress of the People's Deputies and a new Supreme Soviet. So basically, he kind of dismantles the system that's in place. There would be 2,500 deputies to meet two times a year, and those deputies would then choose 542 people to serve full-time as the lawmaking body in the Supreme Soviet. So the, the political, um, political uh, legislative executive situation which had been in place since Stalin has now been dismantled. Now keep in mind that you still have single party rule. This The CPD was not meant to be a swift change to, to democracy. One third of the people within the CPD were to be nominated by social organizations and one third by uh, the Communist Party and then the other third was open. And the Supreme Soviet was now to choose the general secretary as the chairman. So the, they had to take the general secretary of the Communist Party as the chairman of the Supreme Soviet. So we have elements of democracy in there, but don't get all crazy now because they haven't been like, woo, woo, democracy. This is a huge step in transforming the political system. The first election to the CPD was held in March 1989. This was the first time there had been semi-free elections since 1921. This was huge. This was a political turning point. People were very, very excited. This is something that uh, many people had, had dreamed about, but hadn't dare vocalized because there could be repercussions. And this is a chance that they now have to really participate in the political system and have it reflect them. But another reason why it's a political turning point is the majority of, oh, actually not, but the majority was won by anti-reformers. 
So the people um, who did not want change, but uh, 400 of the seats were led were by reformers led by Sakharov. Remember that guy that was allowed to come back? He was a dissenter um, and wanted democracy. And of course, Gorbachev was chosen as chairman because they had to. And here's a diagram of what the new uh, political organization of the state is supposed to be. Take a picture. What I would recommend that you do is compare this to the diagram that you have of the political system under Stalin. Now this public excitement for Gorbachev is a bit of a problem. The meetings of the CPD, the sessions in which they're you know, deciding law and all of this good stuff, were televised. And people were hugely interested because, again, this is the first time that people have had an opportunity to see how the government is working. And the, the, and the broadcasting is part of that transparency of Glasnost. Now, what this meant, though, is that people were um, able to see exactly what was going on and able to air their criticism. And people are talking. And people are, have also really high expectations of these reforms. They're expecting rapid, rapid change. Even though Gorbachev wasn't planning for things to go so quickly. One of the things that we have now is part of this glasnost is the discussion of previously taboo issues of the past and the present about the gulags, about the, um, the political discourse the economic problems and now as part of this desire for um, more rapid change you start now having calls for um, to end the communist party's power monopoly and now we have political clubs that are also developing outside of the communist party and outside of the cpd and the of course um bans are the bans on party faction is limited is lifted rather now gorbachev's goal is that um was that this whole process would bring about political stability one he removes some of the roadblocks toward the reforms and um holding the government and people in elected positions um responsible uh, for their actions because the public is invested in it and this would create a situation where the Communist Party is still integral to the system and involved but allows for focus on the economic issues but what it ultimately led to was more turmoil people are wanting faster and faster change and essentially that change does come faster than the Communist Party can react, and certainly faster than Gorbachev can react. And he now faces increasing attacks, as we talked about previously, from the left and the right. The people on the left who want more reform, more change, more democracy. The people on the right who want less reform, less change, less democracy. And um, in 1990, the parliament amends the article of the Constitution, removing the reference to the, the Communist Party as the leading and guiding force of Soviet society. By the time we get to that point, there's a recognition that, well, the Communist Party can't be the all, end all and be all politically in the Soviet Union. The surprise this time is a little different. I know you've been listening to a lot of stuff and taking a lot of notes, I hope anyway. So just take a moment and decompress and stare at this. <laughs>